All right, well, welcome everyone. It is good to see everybody for this first webinar of the 2022-2023 academic year for the Baptist Studies Center. And we are very pleased to have with us Dr. Ryan Burge. Uh, this, theme, this year, the theme of our programming is going to be, where do we go from here? The last three years have brought a lot of major disruptions to congregational life, and there's lots of questions pertaining to what kinds of norms we can expect now and going forward and how to help uh, ministers and congregations best navigate this kind of terrain. So just a couple of quick words of instruction uh, for those coming in. Uh, just wanna invite everyone to turn off their mics. And as you have questions, submit them in the chat to me. The plan will be for Dr. Burge and I to chat for a bit from the, about the findings from his 2021 book, The Nuns, where they came from, who they are and where they're going from Fortress Press about 20, 25 minutes in, we'll open it up to Q&A. And again, just as you're, as we're talking, if there are things that pop up for you, submit those as, as a question and we'll uh, we'll use those for the back half of our, our time together. So Dr. Burge, who is with us today is, uh, you're, you've had a kind of a moment for the last, uh, for the last several moments, <laughs> for a while now. Uh, Dr. Burge is an assistant professor of political science, as well as the graduate coordinator at Eastern Illinois University. Uh, his research focuses largely on the interaction of religiosity and political behavior in the American context. Uh, he has completed a lot of, uh, he completed a postdoctoral research at the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute. He is widely published in a lot of very well-regarded uh, peer-reviewed journals. He's the author of this book, uh, the Nuns, available in paperback from Fortress Press, um, fairly inexpensively. I'll drop the link in the chat here, as well as a second book um, just released in March 2022, 20 Myths About Religion and Politics in America. There it is. So there it is in the flesh. It exists. Hardback. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Burge is also, in addition to uh, his, his work as a political scientist in various capacities, is also a pastor in the American Baptist Church. And so he comes to these questions of religious affiliation and the rising uh, portion of nuns across America, not just as a scholar, but a practitioner who's been in ministry for over 16 years now, uh, preaching weekly at his congregation. So Dr. Burge, it is a pleasure to have you on. Uh, look forward to our conversation today. Thanks so much for having me, Miles. Yeah. Well, tell us a bit about more about these two very different disciplines that you find yourself in, ministry and political science, and how did these come together for you, and what are some ways in which you find these things intersecting on a kind of a regular basis? Uh, I get to ask that question a lot. Like, what's it like to be a political scientist and a pastor? And I, I kind of want to, it's like asking a fish what water feels like. You know, like, I, I don't know because... It's all I know. I mean, I, I started being a pastor when I was 20 years old as a youth pastor at a little um, church in Centralia, Illinois, and I did it for three years. And then I kind of wanted to walk away from ministry, to be honest with you, when I went to grad school. Um, but for reasons that are spiritual and practical all at the same time, I got drawn back into ministry. I started my first church at, um, started preaching every Sunday at 23. And then I preach every Sunday at my current church, First Baptist Church in Mount Vernon, Illinois, for 16 years. I just think it's like two sides of one coin, right? Like, I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, I think there's a lot of value in a lot of social scientists say, well, you don't have to get cancer to be an oncologist, right? Like, you know, the idea is like, you don't have to be part of a thing to study a thing, which I don't disagree with, but I also think you can learn so much from the nuance and the inside of being in the trenches every day, right? Of, of, of standing in front of a pulpit every Sunday for 16 years straight and watch your congregation go from, you know, 50 to 12, I mean, what makes you ask all kinds of questions about what is happening and why it's happening and, and what role do I play in all these kind of things? So for me, the the pastoral life has always been sort of a way, like a, a fodder for questions that I can answer from a social science perspective. So I feel like I, I get all I get the opportunity to see all these things happening, but then I also have the tools, hopefully, to answer some of the things, you know, questions that are being asked by the life that I'm living and benefiting both a scholarly community, but also the pastoral community as well, because they're living in the trenches every day and seeing this stuff. Yeah. So out of your work, uh, kind of your the intersection of these two vocations for you, you wrote this book, um, which began as a bit of a viral tweet. I actually remember when the when you when you tweeted out uh, the initial graph and just to kind of see it uh, exploding. So tell us tell us a bit about kind of the history of this book first, and then 
how did America come to the place where it is currently from a disciplinary perspective, like with over 20% of the population now identifying as unaffiliated with religion of really any kind? Like, how did this book come to be about and how did we get to this place? Well, the book, like you said, Miles, came from a tweet, which is a pretty unorthodox place for a, an academic to get an idea for a book. But, you know, when Fortress approached me to write a book and, and I was thinking, like, what could I write about? I thought, well, why not write about what people are already interested in as opposed to trying to get them interested in something they probably don't know much about? And, you know, I look kind of back through my my career at that point, and I was a very non not public academic um, up to that point, which was in um, like March of 2019. Like I, I had a couple hundred Twitter followers. I published very sort of conventional academic journal um, articles about kind of esoteric topics that would only interest about 12 people on this earth. And when that tweet came out, I went from being a no one to being somewhat less of a no one. I don't know kind of where, but I was, you know, being contacted by CNN, the New York times, the Washington post, the wall street journal, the times of London, like that, that I was on C-SPAN on Easter morning of 2019. Um, you know, so I, I thought, well, man, the media obviously cares about this stuff. And I think they have a pretty good, you know, they have their pulse on uh, the finger on the pulse of what the American public wants. So why not write about what they're wanting to know more about in a way that's accessible, but also rigorous at the same time, which I don't think mm -hmm. a lot of books can do both at the same time very well. Either they're very, very rigorous and completely inaccessible to the average reader, or they're written by a pastor who has no idea how to work with data, um, which is probably bad. So I can do both those things reasonably well, so why not do it? And, you know, the book has done exceedingly well. I mean, it's far exceeded the expectations of the publisher, and it's just gone on and on. I mean, there's days now it sells a lot of copies, like even 18 months after release, it's still selling a lot of copies, which kind of shows you that it's not just a, a flash in the pan idea, that people are still interested in this idea. I think a lot of people are interested in the idea because they just look around and go, holy cow, like American society has changed just dramatically in my lifetime. And to put some numbers on that, in 1972 – 5% of Americans were nuns. So one in 20 Americans were nuns um, by 1990 had gone from 5% to 7%. So, which is not even statistically significant or really culturally significant, but then from 1990 onward, it's gone from, you know, 7% now it's probably closer to 30%, depending on what poll you look at. I mean, some polls put it at 28, some at 37. I mean, I think I, the number I usually tell people is about 30% of Americans are nuns today. So going from 5% in 1972 to 30% in 2021, I mean, shows you there's, this is, I don't think people full, fully understand, like this is one of the biggest cultural shifts. This probably is the biggest cultural shift of the last hundred years. Besides the fact America is becoming less and less white, it's also becoming much less religious at the same time. And, you know, sort of like, what do we, what do we do with that? Like, what does that mean for the future of American society? And I think a lot of people read the book and just want to go, I'm not crazy, right? Like what's happening to me is happening mm -hmm. to lots of other people. And it makes them feel like they're not alone, which I love that too. So whatever you need in the book, I think is there for you to, you know, kind of find. So in the book, you describe a lot of the factors that influence people to become nuns, right? You describe the factors of kind of, and these are kind of like your, your, your usual suspects, uh, secularization, social, something you describe as social desirability bias, mm -hmm. uh, kind of the cultural capital that comes with being religious or not being religious, uh, the internet, family structures, politics, socialization. Um, there's just lots of different influence, like influencing factors. As you look at the data and you begin to try to sort out, like, what are some of the the primary causes to pay attention to maybe one or what are some of the lesser causes what are the what are the major things that you found um kind of driving this shift toward the nuns well the, the first i point to is just this big amorphous concept that if you ever take a sociology religion class you're going to actually just any, any intro to sociology class it's called secularization theory which is you know it goes back to max faber and Emil Durkheim and Karl Marx, you know, kind of like the, the forefathers of American sociology. And they argue that as society becomes more economically advanced and educationally uh, advanced, that it will become less religious. And, um, you know, Weber talks a lot about that. And, you know, it kind of follows logically that if you don't know why it's raining, it's God's fault. You know, it's we're going to blame everything on cosmic forces or why did my wife die in childbirth? Why did my child die as a, you know, in, in his, you know, third or fourth year of life? Because God cursed me. I mean, and if you look at the Bible, that's what you see a lot. There's this idea of blessings and cursings in the Bible because they didn't have science. They didn't understand things like viruses and, you know, 
hydropology and climatology and all these things. So what Weber says is the more you understand science, the less you need God because God is – you don't need that explanation anymore because you have scientific explanations for things. And so you know, the, obviously the evidence of that is Western Europe. I mean most parts of Western Europe are almost completely secular now, especially like in the Scandinavian region, but even places like Germany or France or Italy or Spain. I mean we're talking in a lot of those countries, less than 10% of people go to church every week. Uh, which is, you know, I mean, they got more, they got, you know, church, they had to figure out what to do with all the churches in Western Europe because they're all empty now. So, you know, we were going to go that route. It's just kind of the more interesting question to me is why it took so long. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it took, we're 30 or 40 years behind Europe right now when it comes to cult, you know, religious cultural stuff. So that's one thing, secularization. I, so that just, I thought that was inevitable. Like we were going to become less religious. That's just a point of fact. Um, uh, social desirability bias is one I talk about in the book, which is the idea that people lie on surveys. Um, you know, we, we can't, you can't look someone in the eye and ask them questions like, do you masturbate or have you ever cheated on your wife or, you know, how often do you go to church or how do you do drugs? Cause we're going to lie about it like crazy. But one thing that's changed over time is we move these surveys from a face-to-face -face administration to an online administration. And if you do things online, we know if you don't believe people are honest online, they're looking at a browser because there's no one looking back at them. Right. If you don't believe me, go to like the YouTube comments and see what they look like there. You know, so when we moved our surveys online, I think we got closer to the reality, the real number. And, and I think the other thing is, as more and more people came out as nuns, it gave permission for more people to come out as nuns and made it more culturally acceptable to be a nun. And I think mm -hmm. it's kind of like what we're seeing with LGBTQ rights is that as more people came out as gay, other people go, okay, if they're out, I can be out. And now once you know someone who's gay, it's easier to be more tolerant of, of that lifestyle and that approach, right? So thing, same thing with the nuns. As more nuns came out, we all go, okay, you can be a nun and be a good person because I know someone who's an atheist and they're a great person. So I think we're seeing kind of the same forces happening there. And the last thing I'll talk about is politics. I mean, it's impossible to to pull the you know pull politics and religion apart in America, but I mean, you just look at the data. Over forty percent of people who say they're they, they're very liberal are nuns. It's only twelve percent of people who say they're very conservative. I mean, it's just you can as you go from left to right on the political spectrum, you become less nun. I mean, just it's just stair steps down uh, very easily like that. So there's definitely a strong connection, especially in that uh, in American life now we tie the Republican Party up with religion. And the Democratic Party is increasingly becoming the party of non-religious people. And so I think as that's happening, that's crystallizing in people's minds. If I'm a Christian, I'm a Republican. And if I'm a nun, I'm a Democrat. And so we're seeing political polarization and religious polarization kind of lay on top of each other. And they're actually driving one another you know, to make each other worse, honestly. Hmm. So uh, one of the you, in the book then so this is all really this is all really interesting so there's like multiple layers here to the to kind of this phenomenon of the nuns and the way in which this is this is operating um can you tell us a little bit about uh like who are the nuns in the book you kind of lay you lay out kind of a differentiated picture that when we're talking about religiously unaffiliated persons we're not talking about all one kind or all one argument that leads people here so in other words like for everyone it's not necessarily the economic argument and it's not like the educational piece it's yeah. not it's not all uh that they grew up in a family that maybe had a religious heritage one generation back but now it's kind of a different story like mm. tell us a bit about like who these nuns are so that's that's a very very good question and so if I told you that 30% of the population was X group and they're a monolith, you would think I'm crazy, right? So, you know, we divide Protestants up in all these subgroups because we understand there's differences between black Protestants, mainline Protestants, evangelical Protestants. But for like a long time in American religion, we basically called them the nuns and just kind of went and just like glommed them all together. And I think that's doing such a, a disservice to the nuns because there are different kinds. And I think really that the two primary dividers, which is elucidated in this great book called Secular Surge, uh, by Campbell Lehman and Green, which is a more academic book, but still actually fairly accessible. They make this really interesting distinction between being secular and being non-religious, which mm -hmm. I think is a really important point. Um, secular people are atheist agnostics. Like they have ab abandoned the religious worldview and the religious perspective, and they've embraced another worldview, the secular worldview or the humanist or scientific worldview, where they think that like science answers the questions they're seeking, right? Um, the other group, is non-religious people. I call them nothing in particular because that's what surveys call them. That's what they identify themselves on surveys. I'm a big believer that I let you identify yourself and then I'm that's what I use. Nothing in particular people are defined by what they're not. 
they have thrown off the religious identity, but they have not embraced another identity. So they're not secular, but they're not religious either. Atheist agnostics are secular people. They've embraced an entirely new way of thinking. And I think here's what most people don't realize. If you put five nuns in a room, three of them are nothing in particular. One's an atheist and one's an agnostic. So most nuns are actually non-religious. They're not secular. And if you look at the nothing in particular group, there's a lot of really kind of scary things that emerge out of that group um, economically, educationally. For instance, almost 50 percent of atheists have a four-year college degree. It's about 25 percent of nothing in particular people have a college degree, which is the lowest of any group. And atheists are near the top. So, you know, economically, 60 um, percent of atheists make more than $100,000 a year. It's only 40 percent of nothing in particular. So you start doing all this, this math and you realize like, wow. So in, in there's a new version of the nuns coming out. It's coming out in um, next May, and there's mm -hmm. this new graph I added where it's the percentage of people who make less than fifty thousand dollars and do not have a college degree. Um, amongst nothing in particular, it's a third of them make less than fifty thousand dollars and do not have a four year college degree. It's only fourteen percent of atheists. So you know we're talking like you know SES. These people are falling behind. Nothing in particular are falling behind and falling further behind, and they've not embraced anything to kind of fill the void they've they've left by leaving religion. I don't worry that much about atheist agnostics from just a social science perspective because they have a lot of them are doing very well educationally, very well income wise, they're very politically engaged. Nothing in particular is all the opposite of all those things. They're left be left behind, left out, lost, unmoored, isolated, and they're growing. I mean, there's over 20% of Americans now are nothing in particular. And yet yeah. when a lot of Christians hear the word nuns, they automatically sort of pivot towards atheist agnostics. When in reality, right. they only represent a very small sliver of what the nuns are. It's this other group that is much more interesting to me and much more, I think, scary to me from a societal perspective, but also a pastoral perspective. Yeah, so when we, when we talk about those like folks that aren't in church or folks that don't have any sort of religious persuasion, uh, we, might, we might stereotype them as well-educated, well-off. Uh, maybe they they have found meaning in their life through something else. But I think what you're what you're highlighting here is that sixty percent of the folks who who fall into that category don't fit that stereotype at all. They have a very different uh, educational background, very different kind of social social patterns. Um, so let me talk to you, let me let me ask you a couple of questions then about what put uh, about some of the other things that you that you describe in the book with respect to what draws people into being religious from a social scientific perspective. Mm. Um, in the book, you name kind of three factors. You name belief, belonging, and behavior. Talk to us a bit about um, what this contributes to uh, like people becoming religious, people finding religion, however you want to describe that. Like, talk to us about that. Yeah, so religion's a multifaceted thing. You know, when I say, are you religious? I always want to think, like, what are people thinking when I ask that question? Like, what's the first thing that kind of goes through their mind, right? Is it I'm religious because I I believe in God or is it, I'm religious because I go to church? I'm religious because I was raised Catholic. All those three things can make you religious, but they're not you're not religious in the same way. So we sort of say, like, there's three manifestations of religion. And by the way, this is put together by an evangelical social scientist. That's why it's all starting with the same letter. And it's three because that's what you mm -hmm. do. If you're evangelical, uh, behavior, belief, belonging. And so behavior is like, do I go to church? Do I give money? Do I pray? Like physical behavior, like that's a measure of religiosity. Um, belief is, you know, what do you believe about the divine, right? What do you believe about God? What do you believe about Satan, demons, heaven, hell, things like that? What do you believe about the Bible? Uh, and then belonging to me is actually the most important one, which is like, who am I? Like socially, like who do I throw in with when people ask me what I am? Do I say I'm an atheist agnostic? Do I say I'm a Jew? Do I say I'm a Catholic? Like let's say I'm a Catholic, but I haven't gone to mass in five years. And I'm asked the question, you know, what what is my current religion of any? I'm really interested in why someone in that situation would pick Catholic and not pick nothing in particular. Because really, from a be behavior standpoint, they're nothing in particular, but why would they still embrace the Catholic roots? If you look at the data, it's because they're still basically like Catholics. You know, the church piece doesn't really do that much. So when we think about religion, you know, there's many different windows and ways to get in and ways to get out of religion. And when people leave religion, we almost it almost goes in this sequence. They leave the behavior piece first, which is the attendance piece that goes away. And then mm -hmm. the belonging piece um, uh, falls second. You know, mm -hmm. so people will stop identifying as Protestant or Catholic. And then the last mm -hmm. thing to go almost always is belief. 
Um, hmm. Americans even today are stubbornly religious people. We have a, a belief in God that is, you know, something like only 6% of Americans take an a, a atheist view of God, which is when you're asked a question, what do you believe about God? You say, I, got, I don't believe God exists. And another 6% take the agnostic position, which is I don't, I'm not, I can't be sure if God exists or not, which means like 88% of Americans believe in God at some level. So even though the fact that nuns are 30%, like 45% of people never go to church or seldom go to church, only 12% of people say that God does not exist or I can't know if God exists. So we're mm -hmm. still a, a nation of very believing people. It's the belonging and behaving part that we don't do so well on anymore. Yeah, that's an interesting sequence, but I think that that strikes me as intuitively as, as, as correct. The people quit belonging and then eventually their beliefs change in accordance with what their, their behaviors and patterns are. Um, so in the book, you you say a bit, OK, so this is where the nuns are headed. This is where demographically uh, the 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 survey seems to be showing. And by the way, when we talk about the survey, can you just clarify real quick for our audience? Like what survey are you referencing here when when we're talking and when you're referencing in the book? Like what is that survey? So several different surveys I use in the book. The biggest one is called the General Social Survey, which has been going on biannually since 1972. Uh, funded by the National Science Foundation. It's it's literally like the, the gold standard survey in social science has been tracking um, religion specifically for the last 50 years. Uh, I also use something called the cooperative election study with the real, that's only been going on since 2008, but the value of that is that the average size of the cooperative election study in an election year is about 60,000 people, um, while the general social survey is about 2,500 people. So I can do a lot more with 60,000 people versus 2,500. So sometimes mm -hmm. I, I I have to use, I have a lot of data sources. That's what, one of the reasons I do what I do is I have kind of this Rolodex in my head of like, I would use this data source for this. And some are better suited to answer certain questions compared to others. And then some some questions I get asked are just unanswerable, but I really have the general social survey, the cooperative election study, and then another survey called the nationscape survey. Those are the three I, I use most often because they have, they offer me either longevity or a huge sample size, um, which mm -hmm. depending on what kind of question we're trying to ask, which one becomes more important is how I answer that question based on the data. Okay. So uh, as you look at the at kind of the, the social trends and the ways in which people are identifying, like what are some of the demographic factors working against churches in this picture in the rise of the nuns? Like what are, yeah, what, yeah. are what are some of the things that churches, churches find themselves very much kind of uh, not, I don't want to say at odds with, but definitely kind of in a different place than this audience of the nuns. What are what are some of those those things for churches to pay attention to? The biggest one is that younger people are much less religious than older people, and so that means the future looks completely different than the past. And so that's the the future. If you're a church, is not looking rosy for you. I just think that objectively, empirically, that's that's the facts. Um, if you look at Generation Z, about 45% of them say they have no religious affiliation, either atheist, agnostic, or nothing in particular, um, which is higher than the share who identify as Protestants or Catholics now. 37% of them identify as Protestants and Catholics. 45% um, of them identify as atheist, agnostic, nothing in particular. So, you know, the nuns, there's way more nuns in Generation Z than there are Christians. First generation in history where we can clearly see that that the lines have crossed. That shift um, taking place. Yeah. yeah that's yeah. And millennials, it was close. Like, I think they're probably the, sa the same number of nuns as there are Protestants and Catholics with Gen Z. It's definitely crossed. So I think that really is, you know, the, the future is going to look a lot different when we're talking about, and I always talk about like the way American religion changes is, and people think it changes because people like leave church. You know what I mean? Like they think like, well, mm -hmm. we were like uh, abandoning the pews and that's why religion is changing so much. I think, you know, the reality is it's not it's not that it's the reason things are changing so much is generational replacement, which is that mm -hmm. every day in America, old people die, you know, and every day in America, mm -hmm. young people come of age and the people right. who are coming of age religiously don't look like the people who are dying. Um, you know, in fact, 18 percent of uh, uh, baby boomers are, are atheist agnostic, nothing in particular. It's 45 percent of, of Generation Z. So just figure it out in your head every day. 18% nuns die replaced by 45% nuns. And that's how you get change mm -hmm. over time. It's not some sort of like big dramatic, like we're leaving church or a revival where people come back to church. It's just every single day, the the, the percentage just, just begin to shift by microscopic amounts, 0.01%. And that becomes 0.02%. And then over the course of five years, that becomes two or 3%. And now we're seeing wholesale changes. That's really what's happening with American religion is it's just old people who are religious are dying and young people who are not are replacing them which leaves the mm -hmm. church in a completely different spot because young people, A, are not becoming as religious and B, don't have the money or don't have the inclination to give to churches. 
I hmm. think we're in for a serious um, downsizing of American religion, wholesale denominational closure, um, lots and lots of churches, you know, shutting their doors in the next, you know, 20 or 30 years. And I don't think we're fully prepared for what that means in from a societal perspective, you know, social safety right. net stuff. We don't think about that very often until it's gone and it's going to be gone before we know it. Hmm. Okay. So this is a, uh, this is bracing <laughs> to say the least. Uh, so you wrote this on the heels of the, the 2018 general survey. Uh, yep. Has anything changed significantly since then in the findings, particularly like in the wake of the pandemic? I know that uh, just I work with a lot of congregations and kind of anecdotally, the story that seems to be common is that attendance patterns are lower now than they were prior to the pandemic. Um, what are what are you seeing on like from a from a data driven mm -hmm. perspective? So actually in the in the in nuns version two, which is coming out again, like I said, in, in May, I actually devote a whole chapter to what COVID did to okay. American religion because I get Good. asked this question a lot. It's probably the question I get asked the most, honestly, now. And if you look at the data, what you see is not as much as you think you would see. You know, hmm. like we're, we're, from what we're hearing anecdotally, things are bad. But what we're what we're actually seeing in the data, it doesn't look that way. And okay. I, I think, you know, so here's the explanation I offer in the book. Um, and this is probably like not super satisfying for a lot of people, but I, I'll just lay it out like this. When we ask you the question, how often do you go to church? And people always ask me, do we change that question during COVID? You know, like, do you go to church online or in person? Do we you know, add the online piece of it because of, you know, a lot of churches were closed. And I said, we did not. And I don't know any survey that actually changed the way it asked the question. Asked the question the exact same way in 1920, 21, 22. And the question is why? Why would you do that? Well, the way we think about surveys is when we ask you the like how often do you attend church question, we're not asking you to like go in your head and, and make a tally, right? Like tally markup. Like I went 17 times last year, so I'm this. Mm -hmm. People don't do that. Instead, what they do is they look at the question and go, what kind of person am I? Right. Mm -hmm. Which which one of these not done? Which one of these response options does not represent accurately my attendance, but aspirationally my attendance? OK, so I give the example. Let's say that, you know, I'm a 75 year old woman and I'm a weekly church attender. I have been my entire life. And all of a sudden I have to have hip replacement and I have to go. I have to miss church for three or four <laughs> months because I have to overcome the hip replacement. If I if we ask that woman on a survey how often she goes to church and she says every week, is she lying about it? No, she's not because she's the type of person who would go every week. And really, that's what matters from a social science perspective. And let's say, but let's say when she does go back, her son, her grandson, Chad, who's 22 and hates Jesus and God in the church, offers to take her to church because he wants to do something nice for his grandmother. And he goes to church six or seven times that year with his grandmother. And then he's asked the question, how often do you go to church? And he says, never. Did he lie about going never? He absolutely did. But he's the kind of person who would go never. He absolutely is. So I'm more interested in the type of person you are than the actual tally marks on the wall. And so when mm -hmm. we asked you that question during COVID, I think what most people thought was, if my church was open, how often would I go? And so they answered the question in an aspirational way, which is, if I could, how often would I go? And that's why you don't see these huge declines in survey data when it comes to people talking about you know, how important religion is to them, how often they go to church, how often they pray. You see basically the same, the same trend line is continuing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so what, whatever we're hearing from pastors is not being being, you know, echoed in the data we're seeing. And that might be because of this aspirational hmm. answer people are giving. And actually, there's some evidence in the data. The nuns actually went down um, during hmm. COVID. I have a survey that was done every week during the middle of COVID. And the share of nuns at the end was actually lower than it was the start over 18 months during COVID. So that's that's shocking. I would not have I would not have expected that at all. Yeah, so I think the data no, paints a picture for, of. I'm I'm definitely looking forward to the second edition now to see what uh, <laughs> see what the what the numbers actually say versus what I what seems to be echoed um, in a lot of the anecdotes. Sure. Um, so how important is it for those who work with uh, folks who don't, uh, uh, however we want to term this, work with the nuns, folks who are don't affiliate with religion or don't uh, like see themselves as necessarily religious whether or not they're taking grandmother to church on a regular basis. Um, how is it important for those who work with the church to be informed, the unchurched, to be informed by the kinds of work such as yours? Yeah. And how do they begin to sort out the informed kinds of analysis that actually will help them from the more sensational or the more splashy that may or may not be rooted in any kind of uh, like statistical basis? Mm-hmm. I mean, I think the problem is the human brain is we're, we're, we're drawn towards anecdotes. We love mm -hmm. a good anecdote, right? For instance, like 
the atheist who was, you know, an avowed atheist and all of a sudden found Jesus somehow, you know, had some like miraculous experience. We're drawn to that experience thinking like, wow, that's, that's an amazing story because our brains are drawn to story. But then if you look at the data, you realize that like less than 1% of atheists ever become Christians. Um, so you realize like that one story is awesome, but it represents one, one of one, not one of many. I think that's the, that's the key we have to understand is that pastors and theologians, like story is what makes a sermon good. Like that's what drives the narrative, keeps the whole thing going. But stories, one story is one story and a plurality mm -hmm. of stories is not data. It's just stories, right? And they're, they're randomly grabbed from place to place. The data, I think what you, the problem with data people is we, we, my job is not to make you feel good. My, my job is not to like leave you feeling like, wow, this is great. And a moment of hope, you know, I always try to say like my, my data makes the left, right. And the right mad, it, you know, that, that makes the conservatives mad. The liberals mad, makes Christians mad, makes atheists mad. You just got to look for someone who doesn't care about trying to please an audience or tell them what they want to hear, but instead says, here's what the data says and don't shoot the messenger. I think a lot of what I do is trying to kind of weave those ideas of like people on the far left like what I do sometimes and they hate what I do sometimes. On the far right, same thing. Christians sometimes love what I do, but other times they hate what I do. You know, I think that's what we have to be is we have to be as objective as we possibly can be. And I'll be very honest. When I write books like this, I'm writing primarily as a social scientist because there's a lot of pastors out there. There's not a lot of social scientists out there who work in religion, A, but also understand, you know, the world from a religious perspective, B. So I should focus more on that side of myself because that's the flavor I can bring that no one else can bring. So you got to be really, really careful. You got to look at someone's background. Are they just a pastor? Like not just a pastor. Are they a theologian who has no statistical training? And if they are, then you probably shouldn't put as much veracity in them as you do in people who literally spent the last 15 or 20 years of their lives focusing on these questions to try to answer these questions in an empirically rigorous way. Pastors are great, but I even say it in 20 myths. Stay in your lane. You know, like I, I, I do not go into like Hebrew etymology. Like that's not how I roll, but you shouldn't get into, you know, start talking about survey bias and non-response bias and stuff, because that's not your area either. You stay in your lane. I stay in mine and we'll all be happy. That's the problem we run into is that people want to cross over into other lanes. And I do that too sometimes, but you have to be very, very careful about that stuff. Stay in our lane and know what we know, and then be willing to say, when we don't know what we don't know, I don't know, that's not my area of expertise, and let someone else handle the question from that point forward. Right, defer to those that have the expertise and the training in a particular in a particular area and on a particular question. That's good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so I want you to, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to put on your, um, your, your pastor hat for just a second then. Yep. Uh, so for those in the, so we have a number in our audience that work with, uh, and I'm just kind of looking at our people here, the ones that I, that I know, uh, we have folks here who are retired professors. We have those that are working with college students. We have a number that work, uh, with folks in the community who are ministers in various ways. Uh, what would you say to them, like as one minister to another, how do how do we make best use of the data and the work that you're doing here? And what kinds of what kinds of approaches would you rec would you commend to them in light of the kinds of things that you've that you that you raise in the book? So I wrote an article for the Gospel Coalition last year called "Stop Trying to Convert Atheists." Like it's just a waste of time. I mean, I think the problem with pastors is they get a, I mean, we do this too in social science. Get a big fancy training, educational background. We want to go like head to head and spar with someone. But, you know, Philip Yancey once said, no one ever became a Christian because they lost the argument. You know, like, I think that's all in some ways just not a value. It's not a very good use of time. You know, pastors debating atheists on things, because honestly, the people in the room that want to listen to that are not fringe people. You know, like they're 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 one, on one side or the other. They're not in the middle trying to really parse things out. They want to see someone win a debate or lose a debate. So what I what I argue is that we should think a lot about the nothing in particular. What I just told you about 20, 25 percent of Americans, including 33 percent, the most popular uh, religious choice amongst young people, college age people is nothing in particular, not Protestant, Catholic or Jewish or atheist or agnostic. It's nothing in particular. A third of them say they're nothing in particular. These are people who are willing to come back. If you look at the data, about one in five of them come back to Christianity over over a four year period of time. So they're not reluctant to become uh, to come back into the fold at some point. The problem is these people are hard to spot because they fall through the cracks. They're not the ones yelling about how God doesn't exist. They're not that you know the, the people who are humanists you know who or are trying to proselytize people online to become like them. They don't believe in anything, and they really feel society's left them behind. And they in so in many ways society has left them behind. And so they're the ones who who you don't see. And so you know I think part of what the Christian message is see the unseeable. The invisible people are the ones that should be made visible to God. 
and I think, you know, in the Luke and, you know, directive, the last shall be first and the first shall be last in the kingdom. A lot of these nothing particulars are last on earth. Um, they're the ones not getting ahead. And those are the ones we should be focusing on. They're hard to find, but they're the ones most willing to hear the message. And they're actually, I think they're the ones who could benefit the most from being part of a religious community because they get the socialization they need. They get the economic support. They need that, you know, that social network is so incredibly important. Can get them back in school, can get them through college and get them a good job, can find babysitting for their kids. All those little things. Those are the kind of people who need those things and they have no connection to make it happen. So churches should focus on finding ways to reach out to that group of people. It's interesting because the ones that, uh, yeah, that corresponds pretty well, the ones who have been left behind and the ones who seem to be the most interested and most open to religion and coming back are actually the largest section of the nuns. So that's, yeah. that's all, that's all interesting, interesting. And I think in uh, challenging, but also, um, I don't know, in, uh, encouraging in some ways that all is not, uh, all is not lost. Um, so we have one question here, and I think this is, re this is with respect to, uh, how I think getting a better description of the nuns, we have one, uh, a question, is there any link between major societal characteristics like homelessness, crime, divorce, and so forth, uh, with respect to the nuns? Do we see a higher incidence of, of these things with, uh, with respect to the nuns, or is it kind of no, no, so no respect of persons? So for, for nothing in particular, you, you see a lot more of them reporting bad things happening during the course of a year, like things like I got divorced in the last year. I lost a job in the last year. Um, I got a pay cut in the last year. Right. So, um, you know, that's that the kind of the negative things we see, like people on the edge, like the razor's edge of the financial system in America. That's mm -hmm. what we're seeing a lot in the data is they're struggling with, you know, there's this idea called deaths of despair, which are basically suicide and drug overdoses. I don't have any data on this directly, but I can almost guarantee you that nothing in particular are more likely to die deaths of despair than other types of people. So, you know, mm -hmm. I think I think we're seeing them them dealing with a lot of the bad things that happen in society. Um, let me ask a very different question since we're uh, again, as, as you have questions for Dr. Burge, please drop them in the Q&A and we'll continue on. I want to ask a question here uh, and something we kind of touched on here on conversion rates. So you note at the at the tail end of the book that one of the things, one of the, the, the things which the survey shows is the, uh, the conversion rate uh, away from being a nun toward um, being religious in some sort of, in some form or fashion. Um, what do you see as some of the factors, play, like the sociological factors playing into that? What are, what are some of the things that ministers need to pay attention to? Yeah, so we really need to think about why people change religion and what causes them to do that and what doesn't cause them to do that. And I think yeah, I talk a lot more about this in the in the, in the second edition. But a lot, one thing I've I've spoken to a lot of seminarians, and I've gone to a lot of you know you know seminaries and pastoral conferences and stuff over the last year. And there's this old saying in social science, which is if you give someone a hammer, the whole world looks like a nail. Um, mm -hmm. Which is the idea that what the way you're trained to think about the world is a lot of how you think about the world, right? You go looking for things of evidence of that. So if you're a pastor, you've been trained to think everything is vertical, right? Everything's about God and the Holy Spirit and spiritual, uh, you know, actions and awakenings and things like that. So when people leave your church, you think we're not praying enough. We're not serving enough. We're not, do we're not doing all these spiritual things that we should, or God's, you know, not blessing us right now. And I, I, I would caution pastors to think a lot more horizontally about the world around them. You know, I, I think, I think about too horizontally and they think about it too vertically. So somewhere between those two things, you get the right answer. What I mean by horizontal is the church at the end of the day is a social organization. It's people voluntarily coming together uh, multiple times a week to join in voluntary worship together and voluntary community building and socialization. That's really what it is. And, you know, it's, is it different than the Elks Club? Yeah, but not as much as you think it is. So I'm much more interested in the solutions to problems being social as opposed to vertical, right, you know, spiritual. And I think a lot of times why people leave your church is because you're in a dying community, you know, in terms of population-wise. It's not because you're a bad pastor. You're not praying enough. Or And, and part of this is preaching to myself because every church I've ever been at is smaller today than it was 10 years ago, like every single one. And the question is, am I a bad pastor? Probably. But more often what, what's happening is the, the macro level stuff, the social level stuff is what's changing around me. And it's really hard to push back in a climate where everything's at your face. You know, the wind is blowing uh -huh. your face, not your back. So pastors need to be thinking about like, how do we serve the community well with what we have and be less interested in growth as the first outcome? right? The, the operative goal should not be growth. It should be doing what it takes to build the kingdom of God. 
And then if growth happens because of that, that's great. But if it doesn't happen, that is not evidence of, you know, your spiritual defect. It might be evidence of something socially happening, macro level happening that has nothing to do with you. So I think we need to think a lot more about horizontal solutions to our problems as opposed to vertical ones and realizing those two things are deeply, deeply intertwined. Here's, here's the takeaway. Lots of people come to church for the wrong reasons and stay for the right reasons. You know, I think a lot of people go to church because they, they started dating a girl that went to church or they had a free, you know, food giveaway or they had vacation Bible school for the kids. And it was basically a free babysitter over the summer. I mean, you pick, but churches are making reason, you know, wrong reasons for people to come. And you know why people stay? Because they realize the community helps them feel better about themselves, gives them a social safety net, makes them feel like they're loved and supported and encouraged. They leave feeling better than they came. That's what they see over time, but you have to get them in the door somehow. And I think churches need to think about give, giving more, making more doors in their church, making easier to access their church in a metaphorical sense. You know, mm-hmm. I always talk about, you know, uh, barbecues, uh, potlucks, uh, carnivals, do whatever it takes to get people on the grounds of the church and just show people that you're normal human beings trying to live a life that's, you know, not perfect. Uh, and you would love to work alongside them to, to do that as well. So you you've referenced a number of times that uh, this is this is one of the things I think that's most interesting about you is that you you have this long career in ministry now. Uh, what do you tell to congregations that uh, like particularly ones you've worked with that are, get anxious about this kind of thing? Like yeah. what do <laughs> is yeah. it just is it just a bucket of cold water or is there any um, how do you how do you uh, how do you approach like congregations that are actively worrying, what if, you know, maybe, maybe it's our church that will be closing in the next, in the next five to 10 years. Yeah. So there's this great saying that we should pray like everything depends on God, but work like everything depends on us. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think churches need to think a lot about the both parts of that, right? Like you can only do so much in the situation that you're in to be the best church you can be in the circumstances that you're in. And one of the things that changed, changed the world for my church was this, this phrase I heard, the sentence that I heard from a pastor said, if your church closed down, would anyone outside your membership really care? And I thought about that a lot. And I thought, man, we are about 40 people at the time, 35, 40 people at the time. I don't think so. You know, I think that we are what we are. You know, like no, it's just our membership is, is blessed by us being here, but we're not blessing the community. And so we started a brown bag program where we pack a brown bag of food every Friday and, and take it to our, our local schools. We have a lot of poverty. 85% of our kids are on free or reduced lunch. And so we pack those bags up, over 225 bags every week. Program costs over $9,000, which our total budget is $40,000. So literally 25% of all our money goes to this one program. But we bless all these kids in our community. And so now I know if our church closes down, there's going to be 225 kids in the public schools every single week during the school year who are not going to be fed over the weekend because we don't exist anymore. And that means we matter. You know, we're building the kingdom of God in our community by feeding hungry kids. Like how, how less offensive can you be than we feed hungry kids? And for everyone who is anti-religion, anti-faith, anti-church, and some for ma- very many good reasons, I can say to them, we, our church feeds 9,000 kids every single year. What do you do? You know what I mean? Like how do you respond to that? We are doing good things for our community. And I think at the end of the day, it's all you can do is try to make your community a better place, your world a better place. And if your church becomes twice as large in a year, that's great. Or if it becomes half as large in a year, that's fine too. It's not your job to grow. It's your job to be faithful to the mission of your church. And whatever happens, come what may, you got to stick to that goal and that, you know, run that race as best you can for as long as you can and let God figure everything else out. I like that you end the book uh, kind of with this word toward ministers, particularly you draw from uh, Matthew chapter 13, where you say uh, just to throw the seed, you know, feeling helpless, just keep throwing out the seed. And you kind yeah. of offer this offer this riff on on the sower and the seed. And one of the, one of the interesting things about that passage is that wherever the seed is thrown within that parable, it begins to take root. It doesn't uh, it doesn't. It's not as if the only seed that takes root in that parable is the stuff that gets thrown to the to the good soil, but it, it actively begins to take root wherever. And that it actually is a lot of the external factors, uh, the, the, the thorns that choke it out or the fact that the birds come and take away the seed or whatever, that actually do the negative work. So it's not the seed that's necessarily like, but it's all a lot of the social factors that, that prevent kind of other things from happening. Oh, and, I, and I even say in the book, this the ground is becoming a lot rockier now. There's no right. doubt about that. And there's a lot more birds that come along and pluck it away, but mm-hmm. that doesn't absolve us of our responsibility to continue to throw out as much seed as we possibly can. But then once it's thrown, it's not our responsibility. You know, where it lands is not on us. That's mm-hmm. on external factors. 
So we got to just keep throwing the seed. And it, yeah, does it get does it get tiring when I go to church and I see one fewer person there today than was last week, and then one less than one? Yes, it absolutely does. But honestly, that's where the good work of the community happens. I mean, everyone thinks the great stuff happens on Sunday morning. It happens on Tuesday afternoons and Wednesday nights at the hospital and Thursdays at the funeral home. Like that's where the work of the kingdom happens. And it's not glamorous and it's not glorious and no one gets praise and honor for that. And it gets really boring and routine and mundane. But that's what organizations are about is balancing the books and finding new people for committees and, you know, doing all that stuff. That's where we find community. And through that, we find good things, but you have to go mm-hmm. through the drudgery sometimes to get to the good stuff on the other side. That's right. That's right. Well, Dr. Burge, I, there are lots of things within this book. What are, what are, if you were to kind of highlight maybe one thing or two things, like one or two things from this book that we haven't touched on here, we've, we've covered a lot of ground. Mm. Who are the, like, who are the nuns? How should congregations kind of prepare for this? Where do congregations find themselves maybe askew from where demographics seem to be going? Yeah. Uh, what if what have we missed? What are what are what are some things that you want to convey to us about like this whole topic and the the research you've done here? So one big thing is that there's nothing in particular group. If you like ask them religion questions, they're actually not angry at religion. Like 35 percent of them say religion is at least somewhat important and mm-hmm. over 15 percent of them go to church at least once a month. So, you know, for atheist agnostics, it's like zero, you know, like none of them think religion is very important and none of them think that, you know, they don't go to church, they don't pray. They're just not, they're just non-religious. They have nothing to do with religion. They're anti-religion in a lot of ways. And I think the problem with those people is, again, what we talked about, you got to turn them the whole way around. You got to turn from pointing away from you to pointing nowhere and then pointing towards you. Nothing in particular are not pointed away from you. They're just not pointed towards you. And I think that's, that's the difference is that this group of people is just sort of, I call them the meh category of American religion, like the shrug. Like, I don't know. Like, I don't feel that strongly about one thing. But I don't feel strongly about the other thing either. I think those are the kind of people that are persuadable people. And, and this is actually a really interesting point. People go, so what do they do all day? You know, like if they don't, you know, economically, they're not doing well, education. Well, I think where a lot of them are spending their time is online, especially on, you know, social media sites, especially on, I think YouTube is a huge part of American life that we sort of discounted um, over time, the value of YouTube and, and changing people's minds. And the algorithm wants to keep you on the site. Like that's the goal of it. So it sees what you watch and wants to try to give you more of what you watch. And I was listening to this great podcast called Rabbit Hole, the New York Times said, about this guy who was nothing in particular. Like he's a 22-year-old kid, went to college for two years, got kicked out for drinking, went back home and lived in a small hometown. I was a Dairy Queen manager, you know, kind of like falling through the cracks like we're talking about. And mm-hmm. he said over the course of a year, he watched eight hours of YouTube every single day, and he became a, a hard right misogynist, uh, conservative, racist, basically person. By He started watching a lot of these videos by a guy named Stefan Molyneux, who's really a not a very good person. And he got con- con- you know, convinced that this is the way to think about the world, that women are inferior to, to men and black people are inferior to white people and all this kind of stuff. And the crazy part of that story was a year later, he became a Bernie Sanders socialist because he got the, the algorithm sort of drug him back across the other side of the political spectrum. So, you know, if you don't have these guardrails in life and a lot of nothing in particular don't have that humanist mindset, nor that, that religious mindset, they have no mindset, They'll fall for anything. You know, they, they don't have mm-hmm. anyone in their life going, whoa, whoa, we don't believe that here. We don't use that word here. We don't think things like that here because that's inappropriate. You know, if you don't have those kind of uh, adult figures in your life, guardrails in your life, mm-hmm. you can go into some really dark places. And the Internet's made it easier than ever to take people in some really, really dark places. I think we have to be very mindful of that. Those are the kind of people we need to really think about. You know, I, I can't draw a straight line between all the mass shootings that have been going on and, and, you know, kind of these nothing in particular group. But I think a lot of them were nothing in particular, right? They don't have a pastor who says, no, what are you talking about? You know, you're, anti, you're anti-Semitic, you're, you're, you know, you're anti-Black. Come on, you know, we're all children of God. You don't have someone come in the room and say, trust me on this. You don't believe that stuff. That's not who you are. That's what I really worry about. I think that's where churches really can serve a huge role. And then we need to think a lot more about those nothing in particular is because they believe in nothing, literally nothing. And I think that's where, you know, the church can help them give, give them a worldview that helps them be constructive and make them feel productive. And you know what? Mentally health, well, mental health wise, they probably feel a lot better if they have a purpose and a goal in a community they can work with and towards to make things better for themselves in the community around them. And so that's one, one thing in the book I talk a lot about is on nothing in particular is they're, they're struggling and they need help mentally, physically, socially, economically, educationally, in every possible way. And churches are perfectly situated to help them in all those ways if they would choose to reach out and find ways to build bridges to that part of the, of the society. Yeah, when you have a situation where it's not just an alternate purpose for life, but no purpose in life, then it becomes very persuadable. And so churches find themselves very well positioned to offer 
you know, to offer something rather than nothing. Exactly. Yeah, good, good. Okay, we have one more question, and I think this is going to be our, uh, we'll let this be our kind of our final word before we, we sign off for the afternoon. Do you think that the church needs to shift the way it focuses in general from the idea of what we are against to what we are for? Yeah, um, I think the problem is we we keep letting the culture define us more than we get to define ourselves. And I think, I mean, listen, the mainstream media, most of them don't understand um, evangelicalism, especially with Christianity kind of more largely. I was having a conversation with a producer at a very large network uh, a couple of years ago. And I said, well, it's not as popular as Joel Osteen. And she goes, who's Joel Osteen? And I was like, are you serious? Like- one of like, the largest churches in North America, right? Yeah, like sold 10 million copies of his book. I mean, probably on more the preacher who's on more television channel, you know, more television screens in America every week than any other preacher, probably in history. And she mm-hmm. never heard of him before. It kind of shows you like how the, the media, the mainstream media is really not religious and doesn't really under they don't speak religion. And so, like, I think part of what I do actually is like I'm I call myself the evangelical whisper. Like I can talk to the mainstream media people about what evangelicals think without making them seem crazy, but also not you know, making them seem better than what they are. Um, I think we have to begin to define ourselves by what we're for. And I think churches have to be better at bragging about what they're doing, right? If you are feeding kids, put it on your Facebook page, put it on your Instagram, your Twitter. I mean, pastors should talk about it from the pulpit. I know we're told to like, you know, the good things you do, don't let the left hand know what the right hand's doing. The problem with that is the media fills the void in with scandal and sexual abuse and, you know, financial improprieties and all the things that are going on there. Why not flood the zone with good stuff? You know, positive stories about good things that have happened and the churches are causing to happen or facilitating happening. I think we have to be a lot more bold in saying, here's the good that we do. And if we closed, here's what you would miss. I think we need to make that point clear because then a lot of nothing in particular is go, oh, wait, maybe religion isn't so bad after all. It's just I'm only hearing the anti gay, the anti abortion, you know, the anti trans stuff, when in reality, a lot of churches don't even talk about it that much. They do a lot more doing and serving the community, and that's what we really should think about, at least as much as we think about the other stuff. That's great. Thank you. That's a, that's a, I think that's a good word. Well, Dr. Birch, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate, uh, appreciate the work that you're doing. Look forward to the follow-up volume when it comes out, particularly the, the stuff on COVID and what that, what that has and hasn't done with respect to the rise of the nuns. Again, the book is The Nuns. Uh, sorry for the reverse image here, where they come from, where they came from, who they are, and where they're going. Uh, The link, once again, I'll drop that in the chat. So go pick up a, go pick yourself up a copy. Dr. Birch, thanks for your time. And everyone, as always, from the Baptist Studies Center here at ACU, uh, thanks for chiming in, for calling in, and hope you have a good rest of your afternoon.